I've never heard of, you know, the Rosetta Stone. I've heard it said, but besides that, not too much. Never even heard it mentioned in you know, conversation, and I just, you know, got out of school. I think it's the first evidence of written language. And with that document, they were able to break hieroglyphics and translate it, and I believe it was a French. My passion is that when people see the Rosetta Stone, and if they see it in person, they actually touch it, and they can see the different inscriptions and run their fingers over it, that, that somehow that there will be a, an aha experience, that they'll want to go online and research it, try to figure out how it relates to them. And that, that's all part of the metaphor, I think, is, is to make it personal to that individual. When I was a young man, I uh, had de started developing a great interest in archaeology. And everywhere I went around archaeology all pointed back to the Rosetta Stone as, as uh, something that informed the whole soft science of archaeology. The more I, I looked into the Rosetta Stone, the more I realized how important this artifact is. The original Rosetta Stone is currently displayed at the British Museum in London, England. And from all indications, sometime in the 1970s, the British Museum made about 12 to 15 first-generation reproductions of the face of the original Rosetta Stone. I was able to acquire one of them. And immediately I began to think about, uh, uh, I saw the, here's the face. Now what if, were able to reproduce or reconstruct the sides and the rear of the Rosetta Stone and then make a full-size three-dimensional replica of the Rosetta Stone. How cool would that be? And, and how, uh, what kind of impact would that have in educating hopefully literally millions of young people of all ages? it bears a remarkable resemblance to the Rosetta Stone. And of course the provenance is, uh, to my knowledge, this is the first and the only full-size three-dimensional replica of the famous Rosetta Stone in the world that's available to the general public. Now the port city of Rosetta is located at the mouth of the Nile River in Egypt, right along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And in 1798, Napoleon and his French troops decided to attack Egypt, desiring to cut off the trade route between Great Britain and India. Napoleon mobilized some of his troops to build a strategic military fort known as Fort Julian, which was near Rosetta on the west bank of the Nile. And as they were digging out the old foundation of a structure, they came upon this, this rather large rock. It was um, about 45 inches tall, about 30 inches wide, about 11 inches thick. There were three different inscriptions on it. And so you, at the top part, you have hieroglyphics. Uh, it comes from the Greek language, uh, which means priestly carvings. The middle part, a Coptic language, a kind of a Coptic language, a demotic script, and then the bottom, Greek. They, they read the Greek, and they realized that um, in the last sentence it said the same thing is going to be written in all three languages. And they thought, oh my goodness, we have just stumbled upon a treasure. Because if we can, if we know what the Greek said, 
then we can determine perhaps what the hieroglyphics is saying. Because as they looked around, there's all these different hieroglyphic inscriptions, and no one knew what it said. And they thought, maybe if we can crack the code to hieroglyphics through knowing what the Greek said, then we can uh, uh, crack the code to the secrets of Egypt. You might wonder, why did the French soldiers in the summer of 1799 become so adamantly curious about such a treasure, wanting to unlock the secrets of ancient Egypt? Well, let's just take a step back in time. For about 15 centuries, people, fascinated, gazed upon Egyptian hieroglyphics without comprehending their meaning. And when the French soldiers arrived in Egypt for this military campaign, they were surrounded by a mysterious yet highly advanced civilization built by ancient people. Now imagine what they must have been thinking as they saw enormous temples and obelisks and statues and other architectural wonders, including one of the seven wonders of the world, the pyramids. They were overwhelmed by the advanced technology available to the original inhabitants of this strange land. Now, how did these ancient people outdo modern technology? And how could this question be answered if they don't know the language? Understanding the language of these ancient people could very well open the doors to understanding the historical values, the religions, the civil life, politics, the rhythm of life at the time, and its context to world history. And the Europeans knew this. It actually took, I think it was about 23 years to crack the code. They found it in 1799. In 1822, around September, they cracked the code. And uh, that was, uh, was a long, involved process. There were many people involved in the process. You had the back-channel drama between the British and the French. They hated each other. <laughs> and so you can imagine there's proprietary information that the, the French have, uh, that, that the British have, and were they going to share it with each other? And if so, uh, who's going to take the credit for it? When cooler heads prevail, uh, they, they realized that, that it was uh, different things that people brought to the, to, to the surface. Some of the key contributors include de Saussé, a Frenchman, expert in Semitic languages, able to identify symbol groups that comprise words, including some proper names. And also Johan Ackerblom, a Swedish diplomat. He noticed similarities between Demotic inscriptions and the Coptic language. And then there was Reverend Stephen Weston. He was an Englishman. He presented the very first Greek translation. You can't forget Thomas Young. He was an Englishman. A very smart man. First to suggest Egyptian intermixed symbols that were both alphabetic in nature and also symbolic and phonetic. He also found the value of six particular signs. And finally, Jean Champollion, a Frenchman an expert in linguistics from an early age who was the most passionate about deciphering the clues held by the Rosetta Stone. He did his own research and he was able to piece together what others had discovered, becoming the one most recognized as the person who ultimately cracked the code to hieroglyphics. All these people had important parts in the 23-year quest to crack the code of the Rosetta Stone. So that's, that's really kind of the essence of the Rosetta Stone. And that's why uh, IT security, people involved in cryptology, uh, people in mathematics, it's all about solving problems, uh, solving conundrums, uh, solving puzzles, cracking codes. And that's why it's kind of like the granddaddy for anyone who's involved in cracking codes. If you step back and really consider the story of the Rosetta Stone, it becomes a symbol, metaphorically representing anything that is important to the process of decryption or unraveling a complex problem, cracking a code of some sort. 
Perhaps even a universal metaphor for hope, for creativity, for innovation, for perseverance, teamwork, international relations. Even the type of granite utilized for the inscription intrigues geologists. The discovery was a breakthrough for historians. And it clearly represents the art of translation, linguistics, and even publishing. The Rosetta Stone is much more than a roughly gouged, nicked rock that appeared like it was shoved down the side of a mountain. It is the key to an ancient civilization and a modern symbol of human discovery, conquest, and scholarship. Wow. <laughs> um, well, I had no idea there was anything like this. It's extremely important. I think that's really, really cool that we're able to like actually learn more about other places and stuff like that and where like a lot of stuff came from and stuff just because of like, just because it is in three different languages. I think that's pretty sweet. I had no idea what the Rosetta Stone was. It's interesting to find out. like a nice stone and I'm glad he's doing it.